All right, we're going to take a look at a tic-tac bouncing in slow motion. So here it falls down, bounces up, bounces up again, bounces again. And hopefully you notice something strange about that. Let's watch this again here. Let's notice how high it bounces each time. So the first time it bounces only up to here. The next bounce, it bounces all the way up to here. Then it only bounces to here, and then it bounces up here. So what's going on? Usually when something bounces, we drop it from up here, it bounces. Doesn't go as high the next time, goes a little bit lower the next time, a little bit lower, a little bit lower. Each time it doesn't go as high as the time before, but the tic-tac bounces not very high, and then much, much higher, and then not very high, and then much, much higher. So the um, we got to kind of explain, like, why is this doing it? And the key here is rotational kinetic energy. So let's kind of talk through this here. And you'll notice on this uh, quick bounce here, let me just play this again. It goes, it goes spin, 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 spin. And every time it bounces not very high, it's spinning, it's rotating very, very quickly. Spinning really quickly rotating very slowly, spinning really, really quickly, rotating a bit more slowly. And so what we can do is we can explain this using energy. And we're going to make some pie charts here um, that show what's happening with the energy. So at first, when we drop it from rest at the top, it's all energy stored gravitationally, all UG. So the first pie is all UG. The next pi here at B is right before it hits. It has not hit the ground yet. And so all the energy is stored kinetically. It's no more UG. It wasn't really spinning at the beginning. It's just falling down. And then right after it hits, we notice it's spinning very quickly, but it, then it doesn't go as high here. Um, and so we have this thing called rotational kinetic energy. And rotational kinetic energy is still just kinetic energy. Um, and we will have a new formula for it. And it is just mass in, you know, it's just um, still just kinetic energy, but it's, we, we call it something different so we can classify when an object has um, translational kinetic energy, when it's just moving in a, you know, a straight line or it's moving normally, or it can still have kinetic energy if the object itself is not going anywhere, but it's spinning. Um, and remember, energy is not a vector, it's a scalar, so neither of these have direction at all. So it's spinning a lot, so it has a lot of rotational kinetic energy. Now at D here, it doesn't go as high, so it's not going to have as much UG, but where did the rest of the energy go? Well, it's spinning a lot. And from C to D, the total amount of rotational kinetic energy doesn't change because there's no net torque on it. And then right before it hits, it's still going to be rotating the same amount it was before, so it's going to have the same amount of uh, uh, k rot, rotational kinetic energy, but now all this UG will be sort of our regular kinetic energy. And then it hits again, and this time it's going to go a little bit higher, so it's going to slow down the spinning. So this pi, or the amount of pi here for k rot, is going to decrease, and more of it's going to be the translational kinetic energy the kinetic energy of the, the movement of the entire object going someplace in space, rather than the rotational kinetic energy, which is the kinetic energy of the object that's the, the spinning part of the object. And then uh, go ahead and maybe pause the video and see if you can figure out G, H, I, and J. Um, so pause the video and try to do those on your own, at least think about those, and then unpause and come back. All right, hopefully you tried that there. For G, we have more UG than at D because it's higher up. And these are not to scale. A should be much, much higher than this. And then the rest of it is rotational kinetic energy. At H, we have rotational kinetic energy again. Same amount because there's no net torque on it. You notice the rotational kinetic energy only changes when it hits. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the, the table, that normal force is going to apply a torque on the tic-tac and uh, change how fast it's spinning. It's going to angularly accelerate it. Sometimes it'll speed it up, sometimes it'll slow it down. And then here we have um, the same amount of k rot, so then we have some k here, and then 
how it hits this last time, we'll go into the, the specifics, but it must have hit so it started spinning really, 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 really quickly. A lot of torque, big angular accelerations. So now it's spinning a lot. So most of the energy stored is going to be K rotational. And the little bit left is just our regular kinetic energy. Also, we're assuming here there's no energy lost to heat and sound. We know that's not true. Um, but even if we did account for that, that would not explain why suddenly it's bouncing higher. The reason it's bouncing higher is because of this rotational kinetic energy. All right, so you may want to pause it here. Make sure you have all this in your notes, all the pies, and then we'll go on to the next part. All right, we're going to do a derivation of rotational kinetic energy. So where does this equation come from, and what is the equation? So I have a spinning ball or a rolling ball, um, and I want to know how do I calculate how much rotational kinetic energy it has. Now, if this ball is rolling and rolling without slipping, if we know how fast the center of mass is going, we can get the translational kinetic energy of the ball just by 1 half mv squared. However, we need to look at how much kinetic energy it takes in, in terms of the rolling, or in terms of the spinning, the rotating part. Let's say it was just fixed about an axle here, holding the bicycle wheel up, not letting it move, and I was just spinning the bicycle wheel. That thing can cause some damage. It can cause some change because all these parts are moving. The bicycle wheel itself maybe isn't going anywhere. Like this point is staying still. But all these parts are moving, so they have some kinetic energy. So how do we figure that out? What is the k-rod of this rolling disc? Well, the answer is it's the sum of the kinetic energy of every little piece of the disc. If you haven't figured this out, these are the notes that go below the um, pie charts. So to get the kinetic energy of all this, I'm going to take the kinetic energy of this little chunk of mass here, plus the kinetic energy of this little chunk of mass here, plus this one here, plus this one here, plus this one here. I'm going to do 1 half mv squared for every single little tiny piece of mass on this disk. I add them all up, and that's the total kinetic energy. So I'm going to show you how to do that with some, some neat math here. So I'm going to do a summation. I'll walk you through it. It's OK if you haven't done this in math class. And what this means is the kinetic energy of the disk, or the rotational kinetic energy. I really could add a subscript here, rotational kinetic energy. It's going to be this. Um, again, it's all just kinetic energy in the end. Um, is 1 half mv squared. Okay. But what are these little i's here, and what does this mean? Well, that i, each of the i, in what I'm going to call it here, the math teachers will call it something different, which they're more correct. But for our purposes, we're going to say i means an individual piece. And this is a summation. So all I'm going to do to get the total kinetic energy of this big disk is I'm going to do 1 half mv squared for this little part, that individual piece, plus 1 half mv squared for that little individual piece. I'm going to sum up all the, all the m's and v squares for every single little piece on this disk. All right. Well, if I'm taking equal parts of, or actually for first, because we know some, some rotation things, I can change, instead of writing v sub i, so the velocity of this piece plus velocity of this piece plus velocity of this piece, I know that omega is the same for all the pieces because it's on a fixed disk here. So maybe this is going to make our sum easier. So omega is going to be the same for all of them. So instead of the, the v for this one, which is different than the v for this one, which is different than the v for this one, the omega is all the same. So it's just going to be one number. So the, uh, rotational speed of the disk. Now I'll need the different um, radii here. And how did I go from v to omega times r? That's a bridge equation. So the translational, the linear speed is equal to omega, the rotational speed, times r, the distance from the axis of rotation. So omega equals, or v equals omega times r is a bridge equation. That's how I'm doing that. All right, so I have this equation here. Still looks kind of scary. We're going to make it look uh, digestible in the end. So same equations from before, just copied them to the screen. This omega is the same for every single piece. So I don't have to add up. It's the same omega, so I can actually like, factor it out um, and just multiply it by the whole thing in the end. So remember, it is omega squared, but I'm just going to factor it out here, put it out front, because it is the same for all of them, just like this half is the same for all of them. So 1 half omega squared. Omega is constant for all the points on the object times the summation of each little mass times each little mass's uh, distance from the axis of rotation squared. So remember, this is you know an infinite number, a billion, billion little pieces of mass all across this disk that I'm adding up. Now, 
mr squared. What is the mr squared for this part? Well, that's just the rotational inertia of that little piece of mass. Well, the mr squared for this part is the rotational inertia of that little piece of mass. So all I'm doing here is I'm adding up the rotational inertia of every single point mass, just like on the windmill lab where we could add up the rotational inertia of the mass that was on the end of the windmill blade plus the rotational inertia of the mass that was on the other end of the windmill blade. I can add up rotational inertias of point masses and get the total rotational inertia of an object. So that's all I'm doing here. mr squared is just the rotational inertia of an object. The sum of, of this. This is adding up all the rotational inertias of all the little pieces. However, we have a formula for a solid disk for the rotational inertia of the solid disk. Um, and we have a shortcut. Instead of writing mr squared, we can just write i. And so um, I'm instead of mr squared, it's just i here. So now I've gotten rid of the sum completely. So the rotational energy of an object is 1 half times i, the rotational inertia of the object, times omega squared, where omega is its angular speed. Now careful, we have a one-half here, and sometimes with an i, like the i of a solid disk, has a one-half in it as well. This one-half out front is not the one-half for um, the coefficient or the shape of the object. That is separate. So this i right here is the coefficient times m times r squared for that object. So um, a lot of times people will, will forget that coefficient or think that this one half is the coefficient. So be careful on that. So last little bit, I want to explain why does Tic Tac do that? Why if I drop a tennis ball, it bounces you know a little bit less each time. It doesn't bounce more than the time before randomly. So why does the Tic Tac do that? As I said earlier, it's all about torque. So a tennis ball, axis of rotation right in the middle, there's no torque because our perpendicular is zero. So if I want to draw a line from the axis of rotation to um, this force, and that line is going to be perpendicular to that force, this is that r perpendicular we talked about way earlier in the unit, that r perpendicular is going to be zero. However, with a tic-tac, here's the axis of rotation, here's the normal force. If I draw a line that is perpendicular from the axis of rotation to the force, call this the line of action of the force, this is also called the lever arm, that's going to be some torque. That's going to be lots of torque here because that r perpendicular is not zero. So remember torque, one of our equations is the force times r perpendicular. Or sometimes it doesn't spin as much, we may have a small torque to it. So this r perpendicular is small depending on how the tic-tac lands. So to summarize, depending on how the tic-tac hits, it may spin more, more k rotational, so lay less translational kinetic energy. Remember, kinetic energy is not a vector. These aren't directions of energies. Or it may spin less. So less may cause it to spin less than before, less k rotational, and more kinetic energy. And that's what's going to cause it to bounce up and down um, those different times. So that's why that happens. All right, well, thanks for watching the video.